when you're ready, Sophie. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this CND webinar, um, Eurobomb, no thanks, preventing nuclear proliferation in Europe. My name is Sophie Bolt, and I'm one of the vice chairs of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, and I'm chairing tonight's event. Um, we've organised this webinar because of the growing debate around whether Europe should develop its own nuclear weapons system. Voices not just from Germany and France, but from the US have been arguing for some time that Europe needs to come out from beneath the nuclear umbrella and stand independently using its own nuclear weapons to take on Russia. Such lobbying has been justified on the grounds of the greater certainty that Trump will win the US presidency in November, supposedly placing a degree of uncertainty around whether the US um, support for NATO will continue. But um, is such uh, US support for NATO really that uncertain? Um, could this be more about the US using yet another lever of pressure to strengthen Na NATO's nuclear presence um, in preparation for a, a nuclear confrontation with Russia? So, you know, harnessing France's um, nuclear weapons under NATO command. Certainly, for decades, the US has been pressuring Europe to increase defence spending. Back in 2018, under Trump's presidency, he was pushing for Europe to increase its arms spending to 4% of GDP. And obviously, the de devastating conflict in Ukraine has been used to justify massive increases in European defence spending, with over 16% increase in the first year of the Ukraine war. The US is also expanding its nuclear infrastructure across Europe in preparation for the deployment of the B-6112 nuclear bombs expected um, to be delivered in Europe and Britain early next year. And now the US plans to site um, long range Tomahawk and supersonic uh, missiles in Germany, meaning that armed with nuclear warheads, these missiles could launch a nuclear attack deep into Russian territory. And the warmongering rhetoric from NATO states threatening World War Three is getting more and more shrill. The latest is from former NATO General Secretary George Robertson, who has been brought in by the new Labour government um, in Britain to head up its defence review. And Robertson um, has referred to China, Russia, Iran and North Korea as a deadly quartet working together against the West. And he says these countries are now um, the leading threat to the UK's um, security. And these views are way more hawkish than the former Conservative government. So incredibly, incredibly concerning. So it's in this um, increasingly dangerous context in which we will be discussing this new threat of nuclear proliferation in Europe. Now, the anti-nuclear movement rightly argues that nuclear proliferation, far from keeping the populations of Europe safe, puts us on the front line of any nuclear confrontation. So we'll be getting views about how this lobbying for a European nuclear weapon system fits with the NATO's increasing nuclear expansion, um, what it means for the anti-nuclear and peace movements in Europe and across the world, and of course, how we can mobilise public opinion against this dangerous um, nuclear proliferation. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we'll be taking questions at the end of these speeches. So please do put your questions um, into the Q&A and we'll take those at the end. So um, I'm really delighted to introduce our first speaker. Um, he's Jean-Marie Collin. Um, and he's the director of ICANN. ICANN is the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, and he's based in France. Um, and he's going to be giving his perspective on the situation there. So over to you, Jean-Marie. Thank you very much. So I'm the director of ICANN France. Uh, it's important to, to mention that. And thank you, the CND, for, for the invitations of this uh, webinar ahead of the, the NPT. So I will give you the French situations on this Eurobomb topic which I would like to do a first remark. This wording, Eurobomb, come more from Germany, uh, has in France the supporter use more the wording like Europeanizations of the French deterrence or a European nuclear deterrence. 
A second remark, this topic, the Eurobomb, is more, and to quote some two friends, Xav Egeland and Benoit Pelopidas, a zombie case. Uh, after a period of 15, 20 years, we can say, of kind of silence, the Eurobomb was back in the spotlight in February 2019, with the chairman of the Munich Security Conference, Paul Ganichinger, raised the question of a possible extension of the French nuclear umbrella to the rest of Europe. And I quote, it's a question of knowing if and how France could be willing to strategically put its nuclear capacity to work for the whole of the European Union. This speech illustrates well the return of the nuclear debate in Europe. Uh, last remark, it's a bit strange to hear the German politician asking to be protected by the French bomb when you know that historically France wanted his own nukes to never be again invaded by Germany. Why this debate came back in 2017-2019, it's almost the same reason why this debate comes from now. Trump is on his way to be president. There is the fears of the US withdrawal from the European continent, or worse, the withdrawal from NATO. Obviously, there is the Putin military reactions and the multiple uh, threats of use, nuclear threats of use. In 2017, uh, the arrival of the TPNW, I guess, scares some people too. And finally, the strong belief that a European bomb, which will mean more nuclear weapons, would be the only answer to our security. Before submitting my points two and three, which concern President Macron's attitude and his will to create a, a common strategic culture and the proposal by some French for how implementing this Eurobomb project, I think it's necessary to begin by recalling the French nuclear posture and past French action to find a common ground on this topic with some uh, European countries. So France has a deterrence capacity since October 1st, 1964, when the first squadron of its strategic air force went on alert. In 24, according to the official formulation, France has fewer than 300 nuclear weapons, divided between two components, or rather 2.5, the airborne component, the submarine component, and the naval air nuclear force, which only operates when the aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle is in operation. Since the UK exit from the European Union in 20s, France is the only European Union state to have a nuclear arsenal. On the European continent, however, there are other states that have nuclear weapons under station in agreement with NATO, Russia, and now Belarusia. Will France assert its independence since its possession of its force de frappe? It should be noted that since 1974, the NATO, with the NATO summit in Ottawa, Paris and London have accepted that their independent strategic nuclear force have a deterrent role of their own contribute to the overall deterrence and security of the alliance. And there is also a kind of ambiguity since France is not a member of the NATO nuclear planning groups. About the role of France uh, nuclear deterrence vis-a-vis -vis the European Union, or even Europe as a whole, which means including countries such like Norway or Switzerland, for example, we need to be aware that despite the desire of various presidents since the goal to be independent, there has already been a desire to forge closer ties or implement a cooperative approach to the rule of French deterrence with certain countries, particularly Germany and UK. After all, Germany, we have been adversary three times and during the Cold War, French nuclear weapons were ready to be fired on this territory. And as for the British, this link stems from a desire for industrial corporations back in the 80s, support and to assure that the British retain their deterrence, which notably resulted in 2010, with the Lancaster House treaties and particularly the Total Test treaties that mark an unprecedented strategic repressment between the two countries. I'm not going to go too far in the past, but uh, there is a lot of president quotes showing this objective to Europeanize uh, France nuclear arsenal, 72 in the French White Papers, the first, the first one, that our vital interests are located to our territory and its approach, 2006, uh, Chirac said French nuclear deterrence by its very existence becomes an essential element of the security of the continent, and so on in 2008 with Sarkozy. After this reminder, my second point is with the election of President Macron in 2017, it's clearly possible to see a more impulsive attitude from France towards the, the Europeans. In his one of his First big speech uh, at the Sorbonne, he said in September 2017, what Europe 
Defense Europe lacks most today is a common strategic culture. And he proposed to build that common culture with the European intervention initiative that aim at developing a shared strategic culture. He thus laid the foundation of his political vision for European defense. Unlike the past, the Macron doesn't want to impose anything, but rather propose a common strategic culture, a strategic economy, and a military credibility, with all these words sounds very nuclear for our French. So we are in a world of thought and research. And Paris has an interest in creating a common strategic culture because France needs to make its nuclear deterrence policy understood with the aim of getting it adopted and supported, at least politically, by European partners. And I think that's what Macron is looking for now, a kind of like declaration by, made by a few European states recognizing the role of France nuclear deterrence. This work to create a common strategic culture has been carried out officially at least three, four times uh, in 20, 2020 in his uh, speech of deterrence for the first time, and it's kind of impressive and, and a bit dangerous. A French president officially invited foreign military powers to take part to the French nuclear air force exercise named Spoker. It's the equivalent of the snowcat for NATO. In 2022, uh, the first meeting of the French presidency of the European Union was held in Brest, where they invite all the 54 European defense and foreign affairs ministers to visit the nuclear submarine. And early 24, Macron answered to a Swedish military officer and said, France has a responsibility to make its nuclear deterrence available to Europe. And he followed his thought in April in a second Sorbonne speech where he said, France is ready to open the debate about the role of nuclear weapons in a common European defense. So all of that created after seven years, uh, a lot of, I would say, positive result for the ones who is um, uh, in favor of nuclear deterrence. Some European states take part to the poker exercise. We know that in 2022, an Italian uh, air fuel tankers participate to this exercise. And in the academic field, and also in the newspapers, uh, if I just begin from January to now, there is at least like 20 papers or, or articles on the Europeanization of the French deterrence. And uh, these papers come from young researchers, very well-known journalists, and even some experts like François Hesbourg, who is a, an advisor of the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique or for some other think tanks which for me is a sign of danger. It's like an open, a speech, speech free to openly say or some, uh, I will really use these expressions, unbelievable ideas. The first option that this uh, journalist, uh, researcher, well-known person said is, for example, imitate what the US is doing within the framework of NATO on what Russia is now doing in Russia. So that would involve to stationing some uh, nuclear air cruise missiles in European state, which France will keeping the control of the order of the use. The second option would be to station a strategic nuclear air force squadrons permanently outside France. Poland apparently is open to this idea. This would involve around 20 Rafale, probably one or two refueling aircraft accompanied with several hundred men to ensure their operational readiness, maintenance, and security. In this case, these both options, that means an increase of the deterrence budget, since the arsenal will have also to be expanded. Indeed, François Hesbourg, and I quote, say that it will be necessary because our opponents must take us seriously. But who will pay? States that will accept these weapons on the territory or the Atlantic Alliance, if it's the sharing is realized inside NATO. It's impossible that it's the European Union, as it's there is three members, uh, Austria, Ireland, and Malta, that are state parties to the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibitions of Nuclear Weapons. And finally, this practice means nothing other than going against the spirit and the letters of the NPT, and as well the P5 de declarations of January 22 on title on preventing nuclear war and avoiding arms race. And of course, it will be impossible if these options are realized to criticize Russia for stationing new nuclear weapons in Belarus as we will do the same. The third option is to share the financial burden in exchange of a nuclear protections. A speech by the French president would be not enough, for sure. 
This will have to be reflected in the conclusion of a treaty defining the financial quota and organizing the responsibility on the role of French nuclear force in defending the states, excluding the TPNW members, obviously, whether this includes states in Europe, say, such as Norway. Uh, uh, I give a lot of credit to the negotiations because I'm sure it will be super tough. In conclusion, Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine based on the threat of use of nuclear weapons has trivialized and simplified the speech about these weapons of mass destruction, allowing proposal for Eurobomb where, first, supporters of deterrence believe that because there will be more nuclear weapons, there will be a greater security. Apparently, they have no memory of the Cold War when the world had an arsenal of more than 70,000 nuclear weapons. Second, none of them consider the consequence of their proposal to believe that Russia will remain silent if France stations nuclear weapon in Poland is not an illusion, but it's a profound stupidity. And finally, none of these proposals consider the obligations under international disarmament on non-proliferation law or the specific characteristic of certain states, again, TPNW members. This is an affront to the various legal disarmament and non-proliferation treaties and to the victim of these weapons. And of course, it also means that the famous cornerstone of the international non-proliferation architecture, NPT, will be seriously weakened. I'm open to your questions. Thank you for your to listen to me. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sean Marie. And um sorry for slightly kind of like <laughs> uh, promoting you to ICANN director. So you're um director of ICANN France, just to as you say, just to sort of clarify that. Um but but raising some really um serious issues there um in relation to France's prepared to kind of station its nuclear weapons outside of um, its own country, as you as you rightly say. Um, so I'm now moving on to our next speaker, um, which is Joseph Gershon, and he's the president of the US Campaign for Peace, Disarmament and Common Security. And, and as always, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us, Joseph. Um, and lo looking forward very much to your contribution on basically sort of the US's influence on European uh, military policy. So over to you. Uh, you're muted. That's it. Um, here we go. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, pull it up here. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. It's really a pleasure to be joining this webinar today. Uh, I was impressed with uh, Jean Marie's talk. I look forward to reading it and using it in the future, as uh, those developments are not what we can read in the New York Times. Uh, I was asked to speak briefly uh, about the general context of U.S. relations with Europe overall. Uh, that's a very tall order, especially with the political earthquakes we're experiencing here. But with that caveat, I'll concentrate on the conceptual foundations of U.S. policy toward Europe and some of its imperial manifestations. In his book, The Grand Chessboard, Spignu Brzezinski, who served as President Carter's national security advisor, was clear that for decades, now for more than a century, the U.S. has been engaged in an imperial project. He chose, of course, to ignore the project's disastrous human uh, consequences, including the nuclear fallout uh, issues as well. Instead, drawing on geopolitical traditions, he wrote that whoever dominates the Eurasian heartland will be the world's dominant power. Brzezinski argued that because the U.S. is an island nation, not unlike Britain, and, and to be dominant in, in, in Eurasia, it needs three strategic toeholds on Eurasia's periphery, Western Europe, Eurasia's southern underbelly, and the West Pacific uh, East Asia region. Since the end of World War II, and the establishment of NATO in 1949, NATO has served as the foundation of the U.S. European toehold, reinforced by a liberal uh, by liberal uh, formations uh, like the G7 and others. Lord Ismay, NATO's first general secretary, put it bluntly when he said that NATO's purpose is to keep Russia out, Germany down, and the U.S. in. Over time, this has required the deepening integration of European elites including Britain's and, and France, believe it or not, uh, into Washington's imperial project. Think in terms of Prime Minister Majors and Blair's roles uh, in, this, uh, in, the, in this century's Iraq wars or NATO's Afghanistan war to reinforce the U.S. and Western hegemony over Eurasia's underbelly 
and now the deepening integration of NATO with the lattice-like network of U.S. Indo-Pacific alliances to contain China. Rejecting essential lessons from history, among them Russia's massive suffering and resistance in response to Napoleon's, the Kaiser's, and Hitler's invasions, and pressed by Washington, NATO recklessly and arrogantly expanded to Russia's borders. So we're feeling, feeling, feeling the results of that now. NATO's 75th anniversary summit was designed to Trump-proof the alliance, even as Trump's former and possibly future national security advisor, Robert O'Brien, vowed fealty to NATO and boasted that Trump's criticism of the alliance made it stronger by increasing European military spending. NATO was no longer simply a North American alliance. The summit uh, cemented NATO's mission as a, quote, global and interconnected military alliance, and it consolidated the global uh, dimensions of the alliance. In the run-up to the summit, British and Dutch warships conducted shows of force in the Taiwan Strait, and warships from nine NATO nations are now involved in the massive RIMPAC naval exercises in the Pacific. As we've all been reading, support for Ukraine's military was the leading dimension of the summit. In the face of MAGA opposition to funding Kiev, the summit endorsed European responsibility for future financial costs of the war, as well as for coordinating delivery of, of uh, war materials uh, to Ukraine. While refusing to formally welcome Ukraine into the alliance, whose Article 5 would trigger a catastrophic NATO-Russia and potentially nuclear war, U.S. Uh, uh, you, uh, you, I'm sorry, NATO commitments uh, were made to advance military interoperability, 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 interoperability uh, including with Ukraine, uh, and coordination with Sweden and Finland uh, is being accelerated. Notably, both the Finnish and Swedish prime ministers pledged to welcome nuclear weapons deployments to their countries in case of a wider war with Russia. Trump's influence was also seen in the celebration of most NATO nations now spending 2% of G GDP or more for their militaries. We should anticipate new pressures for 2.5 and 3% spending that will undercut spending for essential human needs, including addressing the climate emergency. As in all recent NATO summits, the alliance was formally reaffirmed as a nuclear pact. We're told that US and NATO nuclear weapons are designed for deterrence. Yet, the Pentagon has been clear that deterrence, quote, has never been our doctrine. President Carter, Secretary of Defense Harold Brown, once testified that with nuclear weapons as the core of U.S. security systems, our conventional forces became, quote, meaningful instruments of military and political power. Noam Chomsky explained what this means. The U.S. will threaten or eliminate any nation that attempts to intervene on behalf of a country that the U.S. is determined to attack. From the Iran crisis of 1948 uh, through the Iraq wars, this has been U.S. practice. Daniel Ellsberg compared it to armed robbery. Monkey see, monkey do. Putin's and Medvedev's nuclear saber rattling has been a reprise of the U.S. model in history. Since being deployed in Europe, U.S. and NATO nuclear weapons have been about more than classical deterrence a doctrine which General Butler, who form, formerly served as uh, the head of the U.S. Strategic Pan, uh, Command, has condemned it, uh, 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 I'll get this clear, simply to say that the idea of classical deterrence has been absolutely um, ripped apart uh, by General Butler, who once headed the U.S. Strategic Command. Uh, but he, he, he went through uh, about 10 of its fallacies. A central purpose of the old and new B-61-12 warheads, and maybe the dual capable uh, tomahawks uh, that uh, Jean-Marie mentioned, uh, has been to prevent the decoupling of the European toehold. It was for this purpose that NATO's nuclear planning group was created six decades ago. Let me then turn to US divisions over the Ukraine war. The recent US congressional battle that ended with tens of billions of dollars being allocated for a long war with Russia underline the profound impacts of November's election uh, for Europe and the world as a whole. If the lying, racist, rapist, Putin infatuated, and would-be dictator wins the election, Kiev will not see another U.S. penny. Joe Biden, who is now unlikely to win, 
He was an old-fashioned cold warrior. Rather than press for ceasefire and negotiations for a secure and neutral Ukraine, he and the U.S. military are fighting a proxy war uh, committed to the fantasy of Russia's quote-unquote strategic defeat, which is to say regime change in Moscow. Biden supports Zelensky's self-defeating war to, to regain Crimea and a Russian-oriented eastern Ukraine. Uh, and, and as the saying has it, things that don't look like they can last don't. But one way or another, we should expect deepening U.S. and NATO commitments to the Baltic nations, to Poland and Moldova, and battlefield nuclear weapons could be deployed as, as far east as Poland. A Trump victory will likely, will likely lead to deal-making and at least to a Ukraine war ceasefire. But do not count on Trump leading the U.S. out of NATO, even as his misrule will lead to deepening fissures in the alliance. Robert O'Brien, who I mentioned before, recently outlined Trump's foreign and military uh, commitments in a major article in, uh, in Foreign Affairs General. O'Brien uh, has pledged to renew nuclear weapons testing, and that's what garnered the headlines. But there was more. Chillingly, he explained that Trump adheres, quote, to his own instincts. So nothing is certain. But despite the doubts about Trump's embrace of alliances, O'Brien reported that Trump's mantra is, quote, America first is not America alone. He pointed out that Trump never canceled or postponed a single deployment to NATO. Trump's pressure on NATO governments, he boasted, succeeded in increasing U.S. Uh, European military spending and making the alliance stronger. There will be massive increases under Trump in U.S. military spending, more nuclear-armed and more uh, nuclear attack submarines, more B-21 dual-capable bombers, maximum pressure against Iran, support for lethal aid to Ukraine being paid for by Europeans, and keeping the door open uh, for diplomacy in Russia. And NATO will have rotating ground and air forces in Poland, increasing the presence there. So I think we should expect more continuity in U.S. foreign and military policies under Trump rather than less. NATO and economic interdependence will continue as the foundation of uh, U.S. power across Europe. U.S. support for Israeli apartheid and ties to oil-rich monarchies will endure. And like, uh, like Obama and, um, uh, and, and Trump, uh, I'm sorry, like Obama and Biden, uh, Trump's military and economic priorities will focus on containing China. That's the, that's, that's the big one. Uh, seeing seeing China as Washington's uh, fear competitor, uh, and uh, and as we increase the confrontation with China, uh, we should expect that the possibility of a danger, an incident, or miscalculation could escalate to nuclear war. The war in Ukraine and across uh, Eur Eurasia uh, is 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 nasty, uh, but the U.S. and Chinese confrontation, uh, in the words of of Australian former. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Rudd uh, is leading, it has a sleepwalking uh, into an avoidable war, which could easily go nuclear. The bottom line is that Trump is an extraordinarily dangerous wild card. He practices international and domestic relations in the tradition of mafia bosses, believing that if others win, he loses. Amidst these uncertainties, I believe that survival requires winning ceasefires, creating strategic stability, retiring military alliances, and pursuing common security diplomacy. Without them, disarm, without, this, without them, disarmament, containing and reversing the climate emergency, uh, peace and greater justice will be unreachable goals. So the challenges, uh, really the existential challenges are there before us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, incredibly thorough and also very powerful uh, conclusions that you come to there. Um, quite stark for us, as we all know. Um, so finally, um, I'm moving on to our final speaker, um, Rebecca Johnson, who's the director of Acronym. Um, now, this this webinar is taking place just before the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Preparatory Committee. Um, and so it's, it's great that we have um, Rebecca here with us um, today. Um, she's going to be looking at the sort of the strategies for using sort of international treaties like the uh, NPT, but also the 
Um, the sort of much newer um, treaty for the prohibition for nuclear weapons, um, which is all about trying to sort of, you know, um, stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. But in this instance, stopping the kind of the euro proliferators, I did get there in the end. So it's really great to have Rebecca with us here. Um, and over to you, Rebecca. So thank you very much, Sophie. And um, sorry, she something just, just came up on my screen. Yes, thank you very much, Sophie. And I'd also like very much to thank Jean-Marie and Joseph because I agree with so much of what both of you have said and will endeavor not to repeat those things. I'm going to take as my starting point, uh, essentially a perspective that is, uh, you will see as ICANN's perspective. Uh, they have a very good short piece about what is Eurobomb and, and uh, very clearly uh, recognize that we now have to rec see this as both the Euro missile kind of, of, of concept of what we were campaigning about, at least those of us who were the older ones here uh, back in the 1980s. The idea of uh, that Jean-Marie was talking about of the Europe Europeanization of essentially the French nuclear weapons for the purposes of uh, the European Union. And this is an idea that, that France has been uh, in several leaders uh, uh, have been uh, pushing for, as, as, as Jean-Marie has said, but it's really coming into its own amongst what I think of as the MIBA, the, the military um, industrial uh, bureaucrat bureaucratic, academic, uh, sort of political. Uh, and these are the people who are giving it legs now, where it never had legs before. And we have to take this seriously. And also, of course, the context that Sophie spoke about, which is um, the context of the threat to NATO that Trump posed in that period when he was president, uh, and I'm going to uh, link that also with the destruction of the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty that, again, those of you that were activists back in the in the 1980s, we worked hard for that and we won it. Uh, we've just been having to relive some of it uh, in the context of the undercover uh, policing inquiry where Kate was speaking uh, on Monday, and we, we've we been uh, hearing about the undercover police within Greenham Common. And we know because Gorbachev told us at a very important meeting in London some years after the INF Treaty, of course, uh, President uh, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, was the Soviet leader that reached out to Reagan and together they then went to Reykjavik, they went to Geneva, they negotiated this landmark uh, treaty. It was bilateral, but it, it got rid of the ground uh, launched, land-based, uh, what were known as intermediate range nuclear forces, which were talked about as Euro missiles, European theater nuclear weapons, deployed by Russia on one side and by the United States on the other. And we got rid of them. And and also, as often happens with when you get a disarmament agreement that really sticks, a lot of other things change. Uh, we didn't get as many of the changes we wanted, but there was the ending of the, of the Soviet Union as such. And if only NATO had disbanded at the time that the Warsaw Pact disbanded, we actually could have had a chance to have on the basis of something like the European, the, you know, the shared European home of the OSCE, if any of you recall some of those, we could have actually had a chance to build our security away from that nuclear armed block rivalry that we had, you know, been born into and grew, and grew up it, with believing that we would, would probably die before you know, for many of us, we would be able to have children of our own. And things pulled back and there were massive decreases uh, from the 60,000 to what we now know is around about the 12,000. But 11,000 of those are on both sides of the Ukraine war. The, the US, mostly the US and Russia, between them they have about 
uh, well, just uh, uh, just over 10,300, 400, something like that. But of course, the British and the French nuclear weapons. So this is the context that I want us to recognize. We're talking not only about the old concept of Eurobomb for Europeans, but we're talking about Euro missiles coming back in. And let me tell you a few updates. We, of course, know that this is the context within which Lake and Heath is being readied for the B61 uh, mod 12, the 12th um, upgrading of the B61 for the F-35 um, uh, uh, planes, uh, the bombers, which I, I understand the Lake and Heath already has the bombers, but does not yet have the, 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 the B-61s because it has not yet got those facilities. But let me talk a little bit more about what I think we should be calling Euro bombs before I go on to, to talk about how we can link up with what we're doing on the on the um in the context of the NPT because Putin played arrogant stupid Trump uh to for Trump to withdraw from the INF treaty Putin already was trying to develop some of the new uh ground-based launchers such as the 9M729 missiles now these look very like the launchers we see on our TVs, uh, which are firing conventional weapons, but do a, a hell of a lot of damage with those. Let's And here again, I really want to uh, emphasize also what Joseph is saying. We can't just talk about nuclear weapons without talking about the context of the, the, the you know, the, the, the militarization of all of our security having in, increased in dangers. Um, so. So uh, what Putin has been wanting to do is, is to basically develop the warhead for then having dual cap capable ground launched missiles, which are essentially the INF missiles equivalent to the S SS-20 or very similar to the SS-20s that they had. Uh, I talked to Hans Christensen a, a, a short while ago, and he also warned that um, uh, of course, that that that, that uh, Putin is looking at long, long range sea launched um, Calibri missiles and air launched um, KH five 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 and and one hundred and one cruise missiles. These cruise missiles that they couldn't deploy uh, under the INF, but they they have trashed that treaty. And of course, another aspect that he spoke about that that Hans reminded me of is that the thing that that we should be also very aware of and, and consider very dangerous is that they believe that Putin could be looking to deploy um, a ballistic, um, a, an INF ballistic missile, such as the RS-26 with a nuclear warhead uh, on the soil of, of that so-called European theater, our, our shared European home. Um, he could dust that off. And of course, be precisely because the US MIBA uh, have been thinking about that the, the Putin was doing this, they have them also been dusting off old designs and also looking for new money, big money, to, to de basically to develop and deploy INF as well as these upgraded B-21, uh, sorry, um, B-61 uh, that are gravity bombs. So this is the context we ha have to think about. So now what do we do about it? Now, some of you may, be, may have seen um, a, an analysis I did for the Vienna NPT conference, uh, which was circulated, but I, I, I adapted that also for the TPNW meeting last November, and it was made into an official um, NGO working paper. So you can find it on the, I think it was number 13, but it might've been 16. I, I didn't have a chance to, to look it up because I was rushing back from London. But in this, I'm really making it very clear that when we go to the NPT meetings, what we have to go to with are with arguments that uh, for the steps for security and defense that the NPT states can take that are consistent with the TPNW. And never forget, the preamble of the NPT is very, very clear about the devastation that would be vi visited upon all mankind, of course, they said that in those days, humankind, and the consequent need to make every effort to avert the danger 
of nuclear war and take me measures to safeguard the security of peoples. So keep quoting the NPT back in its entirety, as well as the obligations that are spelled out in articles one, two, and six on nuclear disarmament. So running through very quickly what, what I'm arguing for is, let's recognize to prevent nuclear use was the core reason for the NPT in 1968 and is the core reason also under humanitarian disarmament arguments for the TPNW. So they share those objectives. And, and these are, are two different ways, just as Eurobomb and Euro missiles might be two different ways of thinking about what is an escalation of nuclear weapons intended or, or at least designed for war fighting, designed for first use, and, and intended for po the possibilities of nuclear weapons being used in, in Europe and in other theatres of war. And they are trying to convince people that if they're, they're only going to be tactical, so they won't lead to nuclear war. And we must push back against that because there's no such thing as a tactical nuclear weapon. Any nuclear weapon is strategic in intent and strategic and humanitarian in, in humanitarian terms absolutely devastating in impacts and we must never stop saying this so how do we do this well we need to get our governments and here again we have a new government here and we have a chance to kind of you know reframe how they how how they think about nuclear weapons we know that Keir Starmer has committed himself over and over again and we have to hold him accountable but we can also go by other means and get them thinking about what are they doing to prevent the use and prevent threats to enable nuclear weapons to be used and to make this under any circumstance and to make it very clear also that deterrence, nuclear deterrence has failed. It failed to prevent war in Europe, which was often an argument, and it failed <clears throat> both sides. I believe that both sides in different ways re were relying on nuclear deterrence, on their theories of nuclear deterrence, because that's all nuclear deterrence is. It is not a property of a weapon. It is a theory and it has failed and it has been proved to have failed. Uh, in the war uh, uh, on Ukraine from both sides. And I believe that that uh, Putin's belief in that NATO would be deterred uh, fueled his 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 um, uh, invasion of Ukraine in, in, in a variety of ways. And we now have to push back in both ways. And as I think Joseph said, what source for the goose, source for the gander and the share nuclear sharing now going to Belarus. So we have to also say nuclear sharing violates the NPT and must be ended on all sides. And of course, all sides means all sides. And, Nate, and this again can be potentially a, a, an opening for us to actually... <laughs> Of course, we have to criticize both sides for nuclear sharing now, but it also can be a way in which we we reframe the debate because both sides have to stop any kind of nuclear sharing or the placing of nuclear weapons uh, or the, the joint nuclear exercises. Uh, and we need to use, use the fact that Putin uh, is is trying to do that with 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 Belarus as a lever to get negotiations on both sides. Relevant governments should publicly rule out the first use of nuclear weapons and understep, undertake practical steps, physical practical steps to de-alert and take all nuclear weapons off what the Russians call prompt nuclear alert and what the Americans tend or NATO tends to talk, talk about as hair trigger alert. These are slightly different phrases for essentially the same thing. And these are both um, operational and they are, 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 there's a way to do physical de-alerting. And we have to be out front uh, arguing for this. And we have to get all the other NPT states, the non-nuclear states, the TPNW member states, to now demand in every single NPT meeting that all nuclear sharing policies and practices must be stopped, must be ended. This should be a clear demand that is consistent with both the TPNW. Uh, I went into a bit of detail in my in my briefings on, on on how to de alert and all of these things and other communications, but I think I've probably just taken uh, more than my time by a couple of minutes. So I'm going to end there and hope that there'll be some questions that I can come back to uh, on these issues. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. 
as always, uh, a total sort of um, for, total tour de force, <laughs> as always, Rebecca. Um, and I think you know, particularly the point you're making about the the pivotal role of the INS, and now you know what's happening as that as that has that that treaty has been lost. Um, really, really important. But also your point about reframing the debate and how critical that is to do. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, there's, you know, we've got um, lots of questions that have come in. So if it's all right with them, um, it's all right with the panelists. I, I'm sort of kind of allocating them where it's kind of clearly, you know, your sort of area. But there are some that that will, you know, that that I'm sure all of you will want to speak to. But first of all. Um, We've had a particular um, question in from Thomas Pitt for Jean Jean Marie, um, and this is: To what extent do you attribute France's leanings towards the Europe Europeanization of its nuclear weapons to Macron's own personality, personality, as opposed to external factors such as the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So if you are okay to answer that um, first, Jean, Jean-Marie, Jean um, and then we'll take some more questions. Are you that's all right? Okay. Yeah. That's good enough. yeah, 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 yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's per perfect. Brilliant. As I said, it's a good question, and uh, everything is um, is linked. It's not just one thing that pushed Macron to act how he is, and or just the Russian actions. Um, how I see uh, the President Macron since two thousand seventeen, he has always been a very supporting of the army, of the defense, and I would say that he really sees himself like a a strategist, even if I completely disagree, or a kind of new de Gaulle to impose again a big France around the world and a, a, a strong um, uh, defense France in Europe. Um, initially, Macron, for his first speech of, at the Sorbonne, uh, he was speaking to give more independence of France and of European Union to, um, from NATO. I mean, it's at this moment he said this famous formula when he said that we are currently experiencing is the brain death of NATO. Uh, it's important to, to remember. Then, obviously, arrived the events in 2022, where uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, which is the second invasion, because we have to remember that Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014. And uh, it probably pushed more Macron to, to act and to try to uh, to uh, open questions and to, to really try to open the topics to uh, European uh, Union's partner. Uh, but I think it's still like a, an elephant inside a, a, a glass shop, this topic. It's very complicated, still super fragile. Uh, you can very quickly go to a, a wrong side. And everything he say in the same time, what he say when he's outside France and what he say when he's inside France are most of the time completely different. And it's important to, to know that. Most of the times when he was, uh, some journalists asking some questions uh, two years ago in France, he made some incredible mistakes when he said, for example, that he would never use nuclear weapons from uh, if uh, a state around Ukraine is, is touched by nuclear weapons or by a massive uh, conventional attack of Russia, which means that so we don't protect Romania, we don't protect Bulgaria. Then after that, he decided to change what he said and say, obviously, we protect European Union. So even if it's mine, I think it's not pretty, pretty clear because this topic is super, super, uh, um, uh, it's, it's very sensible. And we can see what the Germans said, uh, also, uh, the, the, uh, they, they are also not in a very, they are more balancing. And that's probably why they decide also to, to link what uh, uh, Rebecca said. That's probably why they also try to, to turn their actions on the partnership with the USA about some long range missiles. This topic also is a bit, bit strange because for France, you have a deterrence and you don't need like a new a long range missile to protect you because you have the nuclear deterrence. So you don't need to have two protections. So they also try to deal with that uh, actually. Uh, so that's, that's my, my thought about that uh, question. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question I'm going to um, hand over to, to Joseph, and this is from Hilary Sanders. Thank you very much, everybody, for your questions. All of them are excellent, um, really thought provoking. So this question is, if Russia is afraid that it could be surrounded by Patriot missile systems and its nuclear weapons rendered ineffective, could the resolution of the Cuban missile crisis offer a possible solution? I understand that the US secretly removed American nuclear weapons from Italy and Turkey to avoid this nuclear confrontation with Russia. So, yeah, what do you think about that, Joseph? So to begin with my conclusion, um, you know, clearly the resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, was based on a mutual recognition uh, of the um, omnicidal uh, consequences of not recognizing the security needs of each side. And it was in many ways a common security resolution, at least a first step. So clearly that's where we need to go. And not only in relationship to this question, but really across the boards in terms of a great power and, and other, uh, other, other diplomacy. But let me then kind of take it apart a little bit more. Um, well, Patriot missiles are not are no guarantee uh, of uh, neutralizing uh, Russia's uh, nuclear forces. Similarly, with uh, uh, with China, uh, in the tradition of which one of these is not like the others, uh, I've been involved now for about just over two years in a track two process with really quite senior uh, Russian, European, and U.S. Uh, arms controllers arms control di diplomats, uh, former military, senior military officials, and others. Uh, and when you listen to them speak now, what you hear is real fear uh, of the collapse, uh, not only of the nuclear arms control architecture of the last 60 years, uh, but also the collapse of uh, any strategic stability. Uh, you know, we, are, we are in free fall. Uh, the subject of, of the last discussion uh, was about uh, fail-safe systems, uh, the ability of um, uh, early, early warning uh, technology uh, to detect a, uh, incoming missiles. And as Rebecca was talking about launch and warning and the Russian equivalent of it, one of the more frightening things that came out in that discussion is that uh, we've long been told that in 1983, uh, when Colonel Petrov uh, detected uh, the, uh, really a mistake uh, in the computerized uh, message that U.S. missiles were heading toward Moscow, uh, a senior Russian general said, in fact, the message went through uh, to Antropov's um, nuclear suitcase, uh, and, uh, and he was awakened. Uh, and there's real concern now, including with, with Ukraine knocking out Russian radar systems, uh, that Russia's failsafe system uh, is, 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 is less secure, less able than it was in the past. So we're facing really an increased danger. Uh, we have, I think as, as Rebecca was talking about, I think both are talking about the, the tomahawks now to Germany, uh, not, only, it, it, not only a violation of, uh, of the now deceased INF treaty, uh, but uh, you know, really a signifier uh, that we're moving into a um, uh, unrestrained uh, nuclear arms race uh, with no rules, uh, very much along the lines of what took place in the 1950s. So I think we need to understand the nature of the danger here and also to appreciate that complicating the U.S.-Russian nuclear uh, diplomacy uh, is, is, is uh, China's arsenal uh, and increasing recognition that any diplomacy has to involve, uh, I hate to say this, Jean-Marie, but uh, most centrally, uh, US, uh, uh, Russia, and China. Uh, but obviously the other nuclear powers will need to be involved. Um, I guess the, the last thing I'll, two, two last things I'll say here. Um, you know, one, one interesting possibility, looking a little bit longer term and remembering President Nixon, uh, is that with Trump's, uh, infatuation with Putin uh, and his disgust and fear of China, one can imagine a Trump administration 
seeking to break uh, the, the the Russian uh, Chinese uh, Entente uh, semi alliance. Um, Russians do have concern about about China, especially in relationship to uh, Eastern Siberia, uh, good portions of which were once Chinese. Uh, so don't be surprised if we see some glimmerings of that kind of diplomacy. Uh, and the last thing I want to say here is that um, as much as I uh, enjoy being in the halls of power uh, and, and diplomacy, uh, I think if we're going to make progress, uh, we're going to have to be in the streets. Uh, we're going to have to be militant. We're going to have to demonstrate to political leaders that unless they make progress in arms in nuclear weapons reduction, uh, in moving to honor uh, the most important uh, two treaties here, the NPT and the TPNW, uh, that we're going to make it difficult for them to enjoy the privileges uh, of their power. Uh, that's what moves politicians. Um, so, so that's 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 what I can say at least for now. Excellent. Very, very true. We've got to make things difficult. Um, okay, I'm now going to take um, two questions from um, dear Linda Eltringham, um, which Re I'm asking Rebecca to answer. So the first one is, um, how does um, this nuclear weapons proposal, i.e. Uh, the French proposal, um, align with um, recent moves to adopt ecocide as a new law for the Rome statute and also the EU Parliament. So that's that's the first one for Rebecca. And then the second one, again, I think this is more of a clarification around the TPNW, which is um, just in terms of um, the treaty, obviously referring to uh, um, the human cost of nuclear weapons, um, not only in terms of their use, but also in terms of testing. Um, but there is, you know, is there reference in terms of sort of environmental harm? Um, so if you're OK to come back on those two, yeah. those two questions, that would be amazing. Thank you. Yes. Thank, th thanks, Sophie. And thank, thank you very much, dear, dear Linda. Uh, yes, I was an early advocate and supporter of Polly Higgins. Uh, the lawyer that started the whole movement for ch for an ecocide law. Uh, she sadly died far too young, but the, she had already ignited the movement for that, and the, it's it's been really growing. Uh, and I I I think it's 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 a very good way forward because let's let's be really clear that there are two fundamental existential threats that is the, to the survival of all life on earth at least in its present form not just humanity but 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 all life on earth and that both are military industrial um they they they, they are they come from the military industrial sort of driving forces of of of, of from the, the 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 rise of the industrial age into capitalism and and the driving forward of that and the continuing driving forward of that and they both require um not just absolutely global um but also national and regional as well as global policies for all states, uh, but not just states, all people to actually change uh, and take the steps, take the necessary steps that need to be taken so that we can prevent nuclear war, but also prevent uh, climate destruction, which is a slow, if you like, uh, uh, you know, nu nuclear war in slow motion. And, you know, for those of you that ever saw that uh, amazing film um, called The Age of Stupid, what that basically showed was that as uh, the you know as as people started to starve and and lose their homes because of of the destruction of the climate, nuclear weapons started, of course, to be used to try to keep people back. Uh, it, it was it, these things will go together uh, very very probably, and of course, if any nuclear weapon is used, and this was a an issue that was very much brought to the fore and mobilized by ICANN when we began to work for the, nu the, the the nuclear ban treaty, which of course turned into the TPNW. So these things are, are connected, and we ourselves have to reframe security to be about people 
and our shared planet and all the life on our planet. So to your second, so I support that. I think CND should support that. I think that anyone who wants to get rid of nuclear weapons should recognize these connections with the climate as uh, I'm also a climate activist. And I just want to say I'm, I'm absolutely shocked. Today's news, I, I was rereading on the train coming da back down from London, that uh, some of the activists that uh, 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 brought the M25 um, circular motorway, massive motorway, I'm just for, for, for Joseph and I'm sure um, Jean-Marie also knows, for Ju Just Stop Oil, which is one of the grassroots activist uh, groups <clears throat> connected in with XRPs, but like as with Greenham and CND, you know, they have, there are, uh, uh, you know, um, they they take very you know le levels of direct action anyway they got sentenced to f between 4 and 5 years in prison mm. for that today obviously they're going to be appeals but i'm i'm really shocked i hope everybody sends sort of letters and protest but also that all of us recognize that scientists on global uh, for global responsibility have done some superb work on many many aspects of the of the harm that not just nuclear well they particularly have looked at nuclear weapons but also in the context of the the wars around the world uh they've looked at what you know what war the 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 the, the, the climate boot print of so-called conventional weapons nowadays and it's massive so we have to be both climate protesters and anti-nuclear protesters and anti-military protesters. I don't see how we can, 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 can you know, try to be one of those things without bringing in all of those, uh, th those recognitions and supporting others um, uh, to, do, to, to, to do that. So, dear Linda, I will have, however, say that I think you're wrong on the point that you've, that your second point, because um, uh, at the first meeting of states parties um, in uh, Vienna in uh, 2022, uh, they adopted, the TPNW uh, adopted a 50-point action plan. That 50-point action plan not only contains quite a lot about the environment that relates to Article 6 and 7, which are about the remediation of the environment and victim assistance, and which, after a lot of negotiations, ended up stuck with only relating that Article 6 and 7 to nuclear use and nuclear testing. As Jean-Marie is nodding here, we know, you know, all of us were, were most practically everybody in ICANN and most of us, and it was only one or two states that got in the way, actually, of us putting in production, nuclear production as well in that. But frankly, the way we look at it is nuclear production. And the other thing that, that was set up was a science advisory group. And they are looking at all of these issues also. And I can tell you they are looking at uh, the nuclear production side of it because uh, they see that as, as very closely linked. Of course, there's also a lot of activists, the activists from the, the, the areas of the world where, where Britain and France and, and the US and also, let's not forget, you know, Russia or Soviet Union in those days in Kazakhstan and in, in, in the Arctic islands, China in the land, uh, Xinjiang project. Uh, province, uh, the land of the of the Ouija people, uh, India, Pakistan, uh, North Korea, all have tested on areas that have a minority uh, group that they are prepared to put at risk, and they do put at risk through their nuclear testing, and we need to take all of that on. and uh, And I know there's lab rats as well, which has taken on how how some of the military forces back in the day were. And, and still are by any nuclear deployment, any nuclear deployment, any nuclear accident, all of these things have an environmental and a humanitarian impact. So we need to connect those up. But I do assure you, uh, dear Linda and all of you, that the TPNW, you know, any negotiated treaty is hard to get everything you want. 
But if you've got a good review process or a good states parties process, which was built into and a requirement for verification and a step, a requirement for implementation, then what we have is a way to keep building on all those issues. And that includes, of course, ecocide and the environmental bootprint of nuclear weapons and of and let's never forget when you deploy nuclear weapons, you're actually also requiring the deployment of the non-nuclear submarines at sea as, as the UK is concerned and France almost certainly does the same and all sorts of other military hardware. So let's just really understand that. And also let's talk about the money that is being stolen from, um, uh, you know, from, from, from people uh, who are starving from, you know, from our care services. I see that that's happening in front. The, the, the lurch to the right in Europe that is 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 causing such such anxiety and the and the lurch to the right that Putin has uh, sorry that um, uh, Trump has absolutely toxified and 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 mobilized. These are because people are really anxious about their day-to-day -day lives, their jobs, their, their you know, the, 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 the basic income for their food, for their family. They're worried about all those security issues while trillions upon trillions are being wasted on more and more nuclear weapons. And they still are not earmarking most of that money for clearing up the mess when they finally do stop. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Jean-Marie because I, I know that he also wants to come in on this point about the TPNW. So over to you, Jean-Marie. Yeah, to continue to what Rebecca uh, said, uh, just say, so sure, the TPNW mon mentioned the, the environmental harms. Uh, it's well described in the, in the action plan. It's well described uh, just on the, on the article, which is victim assistance and remediations. And um, on, on the on the paragraph two, it's it's explained how states have to act and to, in their capacity to do so, uh, remove or try to to have a, a better environment. And that's a topic. So um, victim assistance and remediations. It's uh, it's obviously the TPNW. It's about to uh, to a private and at the end eliminate nuclear weapons. But these questions are are essential insights. It really gives a, a lot of hopes and a possibility to unify a lot of states. I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact names of the last resolution that was passed last year at the first committee, but it brings like 171 or 174 states that support a resolution about victim assistance and re remediations, which was just a, a huge uh, victory because normally inside this, inside these resolutions, it's it's mainly based about the TPNW. And obviously with these numbers of states, 171, you have a number, huge amount of states that normally don't support the TPNW. So it really shows that this Article 6 bring a possibility to create bridge and to engage a process of actions. And that's extremely positive. Obviously my country, France, decide to vote against, has yours, UK, and also they decide to vote against with UK and North Korea and Russia. So pretty disappointed. Okay, thanks, Jean-Marie. Um, I'm now going to ask um, Joseph to give us um, his opinion. This is um, one of one of Tom Cuspert's uh, questions. Give his opinion on, on Mark Rutter, who's going to be the new um, NATO Secretary General. So what, what do you think, Joseph? So, so watching it from here in the United States, it's sort of interesting to watch the process of audition and selection of uh, NATO general secretaries. Um, you know, it's 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 remarkable to see these liberal politicians, Stoltenberg before him, uh, move up to uh, attempt to in, in in Joe Biden's world, the words you know, to be the the military figure uh, who, who who rules the world, who's determining what happens in the world. Uh, so, so Ruti, um, uh, you know, clearly signed up uh, for the um, uh, vision uh, that came out of the uh, NATO 75th anniversary uh, summit. Um, he, I think, was was identified and supported by Biden, perhaps in part uh, 
uh, because seen as a possible obstacle uh, to to Trump uh, Trump's assault on 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 the um, on, on the alliance. Um, clearly, he's committed to um, a greater European militarization, more more military spending, and more um, uh, military capacity. Uh, as well as, I think we need to, to, to begin really breaking the vision uh, that NATO is a North Atlantic Treaty. Uh, it was a long time ago, um, you know, since the, with the Lisbon summit, uh, it's, it's been committed to out of area operations. We had Afghanistan, uh, and now we, we see the um, commitment uh, to, to containing China. Uh, and Ruti's uh, clearly uh, signed up for all of that. Um, I guess the, the the last thing I would say here uh, is uh, you know the question of, of how how Ukraine is going to play out uh, under his watch. Um, you know, I think the uh, as I, I said in my talk, uh, uh, Ukraine is not going to prevail in, in this war. Uh, uh, it has neither the uh, population to to compete with with Russia, with a quarter of the Russian population, and doesn't have the um, industrial base uh, to be producing weapons. Uh, and uh, time is not on its side. Uh, so even without Trump, uh, I think the the West uh, and its backing of uh, of Zelensky's uh, total ambitions here. Uh, or, or, or failed, a failed approach uh, that really kind of spells disaster uh, for Ukraine. Uh, and, you know, the reality is that, um, and it's interesting, Thomas Friedman, who I don't often agree with, uh, early on after the Russian invasion in 2022, said, uh, as much as I don't like it, uh, this war is going to have to end with a dirty deal. Uh, and, um, it might take is that that dirty deal is going to have to um, lead to a ceasefire. Uh, the status of Crimea uh, and uh, the regions that uh, the Russians have conquered and occupied don't need to be formally recognized as Russians in, a, in an agreement. Uh, we have a lot of diplomatic history uh, where areas that are uh, unresolved. They're, they're left on what they call the diplomatic shelf for future resolution. Uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see how how Rute, um navigates uh, that, uh, or in a different scenario, uh, how he uh, navigates NATO in the context uh, of a Trump-Putin uh, big deal. Uh, and to, then to appreciate that, uh, going back to our earlier discussions here, about the nuclear arms race, uh, we need to appreciate that the Russian, not appreciate, I don't like it, uh, but the reality uh, that Russia is saying no arms control negotiations at all until they're satisfied with the outcome of the Ukraine war and have a sense of, uh, of, 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 of creation of a European security architecture uh, that, that doesn't threaten uh, Russia as much as NATO expansion did. Uh, of, of course, you know, with Russia's military production now, there are, I think, legitimate fears as to what's going to happen in the politics, uh, and that certainly has to be addressed. But I think Bruce has got his, got his work cut out for him. Uh, I wish he were not such a militarist, um, because his function is going to be uh, to promote uh, uh, really the, the world's most powerful military alliance, whose purpose is coercion. Thank you, Joseph. Um, before we take our, we're just going to take one final uh, question for all of the panelists, but I just wanted to say thank you to those who've, um, who've basically sort of, um, you know, put in their praise for the meeting from Dear Linda, from Maria and from Tara Swift saying, um, how much they've enjoyed, enjoyed the meeting, excellent speeches, very informative, um, a special plug for, for Rebecca as well. So thank you everybody for those, um, those kind comments. So the final question we're going to go with, um, before we wrap up the, um, the event is, is from Tom Cuthbert. It's in relation to this sort of, um, issue around the costs of, the huge amount of costs that are going into nuclear weapons and war um, and the the sort of 
pressure that this contradiction that it creates for governments who then are in a situation where they're not able to deliver on you know very serious economic and um, domestic issues so you know we've seen living standards have just um you know have just fallen for decades um austerity you know the sort of crumbling of, of public services so this is an you know a real kind of contradiction for for governments that are sort of aggressively pursuing this sort of war agenda so i wanted to ask each of the speakers you know you know what, what do you think about this in terms of um you know governments that are basically not going to be able to deliver on their on their promises and i suppose it picks up on the point that joseph was kind of making in terms of you know the fact that we need to make these governments hurt um so yeah if you could just come back on that point and then um if you've got any kind of final final comments um around you know um your sort of summate, summating points around the um you know the sort of the the issue around sort of um opposing sort of european um proliferation that would be great so i'm going to ask jean jean marie to come in first if if you're right with that yeah uh 10654 euros it's what france spent each minute in 2023 uh, on his nuclear arsenals, and we know this amount of money, it's uh, it's the minimum. So it's 5.6 billion of euro. I, I'm going to avoid you the, the capacity of do the, the math. And uh, we know that for 2024, it's going to be more around 12,000 by minute because um, the, the, the budget just increased as there is a modernization and, and a renewal of all the nuclear arsenals. So it's for this year, 6,350 uh, billions of, of euros. Uh, clearly, uh, these expenses is less and less assumed by the defense ministers. Uh, for example, the, the old cost of the, of the new military uh, programming law for 24 to 2030, which is 54 billions of euros, wasn't uh, officially announced. We tried with some MPs to open a debate on financial transparency. It was refused because they say that they were scared that some uh, Russians or enemy will know with this amount of money what kind of system we will buy or they will realize, which is a completely false argument. So it really just goes to show how uncomfortable they are about this massive financials outlay. And I think it's a, for us, and it's what that's why, that's one of the reasons since five years now that I can publish each year uh, uh, a nuclear spending reports it shows really the massive amount of money that should be used for other things like fighting climate change for example so it's a uh, it's hard work like i said we really need to, to use for example these figures and to use the grassroots society who fight for climate change also to engage them to fight with us because as soon as we we um we remove this um uh weapon of mass destruction we would be fully uh, uh in capacity to fight climate change. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jean-Marie. And it's been a real pleasure to have you on the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Um, I'm now going to go to Rebecca. Um, so if you want to if you want to kind of comment on this, are you sort of slightly already kind of touched on it already, really, this um economic priorities and then any sort of um concluding remarks? Okay, well, I actually was going to, um, uh, I, I was assuming you'd come to me after uh, Joseph, but because oh, what I actually also want to do, since I am a vice president of CND, was just to really express my great thanks to you, Sophie, as CND's vice chair, and also behind the uh, CND symbol is our wonderful uh, CND parliamentary uh, worker, who Rachel, who's obviously at this time of change of government and everything, working her socks off, um, <clears throat> you know, to be reaching out to all the new MPs coming in and 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 so on. And Sophie, as some of you at least here know, but has been really taking the lead on the Lake and Heath campaign. Um, okay. So I want to thank both of you for actually filling in because I know that you you had to step in at the last minute uh, uh, for for Kate and. Um, and Sarah, and for all your work. And just to say, I think it is just really, really important that we keep on talking about 
uh, what could be being done if we were looking at security as a common security and our common shared home, and also as the security where, that matters to everybody actually in their own homes, and that is our health, our education for the kids. It's 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 to repair all the damage of of the, the, the certainly of the of the last fourteen years of of the Tories just stripping all of our services uh, to the bone in 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 every possible way they could to send the profits to the shareholders of private and so so you know CND has has has, has always done a good job of of making you know um nurses not you know um uh, you know nurses not not nukes and and um uh, a, a lot of those and so keep going but let me also say let's let's connect this in again also with that we need to be spending more money on um the kind of security that has to be done in the context of climate destruction of people's homes and the, all the flooding all the changes that are happening and where is that money going to come from because they're doing the opposite. The Tories were taking money out of that. And it looked as if Keir Starmer was going to be doing that. So, you know, the big, big danger is that they're pumping it into weapons that we absolutely do not want them ever to use, that they could not use any nuclear weapon without unleashing nuclear war and nuclear holocaust but also the very weapons that they are trying now they're, 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 they're you know giving huge profits to the the weapons companies to be arming israel arming um uh in in the ukraine but these are not going to solve political security conflict you know political conflicts they don't so solve security on the ground for any people and i have to say i agree with um uh what um uh, joseph said also about there there, there is going to have to be some kind of a a deal of ukraine to end this war because because it, it, it too many thousands are dying and obviously you know we we should so so let's make those connections so i want to finish us on three very short points so let's really work on ending investment and subsidies for all companies that develop make and sell inhumane weaponry of course we know that about nuclear weapons but i would include practically all the other weaponry that that they're they're they're, they're, they're building up um in that I can, of course, has a very good "Don't Bank on the Bomb" uh, campaign. Medact is leading in in England and Wales, and uh, and also Scotland. We haven't talked very much about about Scotland, but on uh, things like "Don't Bank on the Bomb," the, 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 they've got a very good network, and it needs to be spread now that there there is a different government in in um, that is also over England and Wales and 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 Ireland. Also, um, to reduce measure and publish annual data on national military greenhouse gas emissions. This is an idea that has come up out of Scientists for Global Responsibility, but it's an idea we all need to take up. Um, and recognize the impact of all armed conflicts, climate destruction and nuclear activities, also very specifically uh, on women and girls as the most vulnerable in so many communities. Uh, here in this country in many uh, particular ways through violence, but also minoritized communities uh, in this country and, of course, around the world uh, over any in any kind of a war. You see the brutality against particularly women and girls. Also, of course, uh, 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 you know, young boys, too, being brought into militaries and so on. But you see this in again and again and again. You're, we're seeing it in Gaza of the you know when there's just mass carpet bombing and uh, and you look at at who is is actually dying so let's let's talk about these things and let's talk about about the hibakusha from the nuclear and the hibakusha of all wars if you like the ones who are damaged by all wars and make common cause with them and and invest in the security of all people and our future, our families, 
uh, uh, you know, all of us, whether we have children of our own, we've got families, we've got pe people that we care about into the next generation and the next. So let's put that at the heart of it and build up the services and close down the, the, the militarism. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, really excellent conclusion to to the to the webinar. Um, and so it was just really over to you, um, Joseph, you, if you had um, anything that you wanted to to sort of follow up on in relation to the wrong economic priorities and any concluding remarks. So I, I wish in, in a way that Rebecca had gone last because she was, I think, more uh, more inspiring. Uh, but let me let me uh, just uh, appreciate learning as well from from Jean Marie uh, and and the opportunity to be part of this discourse and to learn from it. So thank you thank you very much. Uh, you know I'm sorry to say that the view from the United States is grim. Uh, I I wish it were otherwise. Um, you know more people here are talking about emigrating, um, uh, getting out um, uh, as we look to a nasty future. Um, you know the. The United States, even under Biden, uh, is committed to spending two trillion dollars uh, over you know, a little bit less than that now you know, over the course of the next twenty-five years uh, to basically replace, upgrade uh, the entire nuclear arsenal uh, and its delivery systems. Um, yeah, you know, which on the one hand uh, brings us closer to nuclear catastrophe, and, and on the other is diverting essential resources. Uh, I mean, imagine what that could do in relationship to um, uh, protecting our city, you know, trying to reverse investment technology uh, to, to stanch the climate emergency uh, and to protect our cities. I mean, the United States is a largely a, a coastal coastal society. Uh, the, the, the waters are rising uh, and the spending on, on nuclear weapons and on um, uh, the military as a whole uh, just just brings on you know, more death, more uncertainty, uh, certainly economic uh, de-development. Um, I'm afraid to say that, you know, Trump says that he is opposed to the deep state. Uh, but, but if he comes to power, I think we're going to see an increase of power of the real deep state, which is the military industrial complex. Uh, remember, it was now more than 60 years ago uh, that um, Eisenhower, when he was leaving office, uh, warned about the uh, subversive tentacles uh, of the military industrial complex, uh, which jeopardized and subverted democracy in our communities across the country. And the way the, the um, military industrial complex moves with investments in every congressional uh, district uh, has really transformed. I mean, the, the the, the, the reason that governments exist ostensibly uh, is to serve the people, right? It's to protect to protect the people of, 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 of the governed region. Uh, and we have a situation in which the United States is an empire uh, and the investments go to the military industrial complex uh, to, to preserve that empire. So we're in a, in a nasty, nasty situation. Um, where to from here, uh, you know, I think uh, I think our movements are going to be in a period here of, uh, for one thing, we've got to get through the next few weeks uh, to see uh, if, if Biden is going to somehow resist uh, the opposition, growing opposition across the party, uh, a recognition uh, that if he continues to, I mean, I, 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 I thought I would watch the, um, the Biden-Trump debate. I turned it on. I was able to watch it for about eight minutes. I mean, it was a horror. I could not believe what I was seeing. Uh, and and now the Biden administration wants us all to pretend, and his campaign wants us to pretend that we didn't see what we saw. Uh, and he's continued to make a, a number of gaps. So, you know, as much as I've had profound differences with the Democratic Party, uh, you know, it's it's a, it, it, it has been at least a, a, bit, a bit better uh, than what we see is the um, uh, white Christian nationalist fascism uh, that's reflected in, in, in Trump and in MAGA. Uh, but, you know, that, that may be what we get. But we, as a movement here, we have to get through this, at least the, the, the dust has to settle uh, as we as we chart our way forward. Um, 
we'll need to be thinking on the other side of where we are, uh, how we can reinforce our movements for nuclear disarmament, uh, to to stamp the climate, for economic justice, uh, to deal with the fact that, you know, I, I go to Japan not infrequently, and it's very hot in the summer in Japan, uh, but their high speed trains work work really well. Uh, in the United States here, uh, our trains are 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 not only being delayed, but they're being canceled because the rails can't deal with the heat. Uh, uh, so we're looking at the de-development here. Uh, uh, so I guess the last thing I'll say here is as we chart here our, 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 our strategies for the future, I think it's going to be critically important for us to uh, increase our collaboration with international movements. Uh, and not just speaking by the leadership of our movement, but finding ways to more deeply engage our bases. Uh, and this is for the United States, this is going to need to be in relationship to Europe, but also in relationship to peace forces in Asia Pacific. Uh, and, uh, you know, as the, uh, as, as, as the NATO declaration uh, stated that, you know, we, 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 we have a basically a unified, uh, uh, a unified threat uh, across Eurasia, uh, we're going to have to build our movements uh, to cooperate uh, Europe, Asia Pacific, uh, the United States, and the Global South. I mean, one one place where we can take some hope is the refusal of much of the Global South to choose sides in the new Cold War. So uh, not that hopeful. I'm sorry I'm speaking from the United States. It's a very hard time here. And and even as we know that there's all kinds of problems with Starmer uh, and the um, uh, Labor Party in Britain, uh, you have to appreciate that it, it looks pretty good from here right now. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Joseph. And I just really want to echo what you said about the in terms of sort of taking hope from the global south. And I think also in terms of the huge movement that is built built um, in solidarity with the Palestinian people, I feel that more and more people understand how um, how high the stakes are um, and more and more people, you know, want to get involved and want to take action. So I think we should really take heart from that. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for participating in this webinar. For those of you who are be going to be going to the MPT, um, CND is going to be, is organising a side event um, in Geneva in the UN building. So um, Rachel is very kindly um, put the details for that in the chat. So um, do click on the link um, and take part in that. Um, if you're not already a member of CND, please join. Um, look forward to seeing you on the next protest either at Lake and Heath or um you know in in London or or internationally but thank you very much everybody and take care bye 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 thank you merci